My name is um, Kelly Elliott. I'm Assistant Curator of Modern and Contemporary Glass here at the Corning Museum of Glass. Mm -hmm. And today is September 25th, 2014. And we're really happy to have you here to talk a little bit about your time at Corning and um, the work that you were involved in there. Um, and so, yeah, thanks for Thank being you. here. Before we start, if you could just say what your name is and um, where you, maybe where you were born and when you, when you were born. Okay. Is that right? My name is Herbert Dan, formerly Herbert Irving Dan Jr. I'm the fourth Herbert Dan in that uh, my lineage goes back in Connecticut to 1684. Wow. Uh, I was born in Stanford, where all of my ancestors lived. And I, after 11 generations, I'm the first Dan to actually leave the old home grounds. OK, great. So and I guess that's indicative of the change in America. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. So um, can you talk a little bit? Um, since we know where you were born, um, can you talk a little bit about your education and kind of how you um, came into working with design at, at Corning? Okay. Well, I've always been artistically inclined. And when I was in high school, my art teacher had graduated from Pratt. This is Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. It has a wonderful art school, architectural and engineering school. And he convinced me I should be an art teacher. Oh. So I applied for art teacher ed at Pratt. And uh, I was late in uh, interviewing and applying, so I didn't make it. Okay. And the Korean War was going on at the time. My mother said, well, you have to go to college. You're going to get drafted. And the University of Connecticut has to take you because you're a resident. <laughs> So I ended up a semester at uh, the University of Connecticut, but while I was there, I knew I was wasting my time. So before the semester was over, I had applied back to Pratt. I had ha had an interview. I was accepted before Christmas, and I wow. started the following year. Nice. So I'm a graduate of Pratt in industrial design. Okay. I spent two years in the Army as a junior officer. I was a distinguished military graduate nice. of the Pratt ROTC program. So I spent a year in Japan and a year in Korea, or about eight months, nine months in Korea. This was well after the hostilities mm -hmm. in 1956, 57, 58. And when I got out of the service, I decided I'd go back to Pratt and uh, get my head back into the world of design. Mm -hmm. I met a man, and uh, we got into furniture design mm -hmm. and went to Massachusetts when I finished at Pratt. And uh, we made some prototypes of furniture. Who was this person? Do you remember and who it was that you worked with? Uh, pardon? Who was it that you worked with? Do you remember his name? Yes, uh, it was Hammond Kroll, the brother of Boris Kroll, okay. uh, Boris Kroll Fabrics, which is a big fabric house at the time and probably still is uh -huh. in New York City. And his brother was sort of uh, bankrolling us, if you will. But uh, the the recession of 1960 came upon us, and the furniture company didn't want to introduce what we we're designing for them. So we kind of separated. I looked for some new opportunities, and uh, the job here at Corning opened up. And uh, so I applied uh, through an agency in the city. and. Uh, arranged for an interview, and there was something about the opportunity that was very exciting for me. So I spent <coughs> a couple of weeks on charrette, just uh, preparing a whole new portfolio nice. for the interview. 
So I guess I impressed them, I guess, the fact that I had designed things expressly for their products, the fact that I had leadership experience in the Army. I was working at Corning in January of 1961. Nice. Had you heard about Corning before you started? Um, yeah, but not much. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that uh, they made Pyrex wear, for mm -hmm. example. I, you know, I was like most Americans, uh, Pyrex was made in the little Pyrex company in the hills of America. Yeah. Uh, but I did design some items for the Pyrex line, particularly blownware carafes mm -hmm. and things like that in the portfolio that I showed. Nice. And how about um, your experience with glass before you started? Had you I had done much work literal, with glass? Literally none. Okay. None. All right. It's really interesting. And then when you started, um, you came right into a des design department. Was it a fairly new department at Corning, Yo, from what I understand? Uh, when I arrived, Corningware had uh, been successfully introduced and was a burgeoning product. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, Jack McDowell, John McDowell, up in the laboratory had worked on a sister glass uh, to the Corningware mm -hmm. glass ceramic with emphasis on um, mechanical strength rather than thermal strength. Hmm. Uh, and it could be glazed and it could be decorated <coughs> and it looked very much like bone china. And uh, so a line called, uh, eventually called Centura. Oh, okay. It was called Corning Tableware oh, when okay. uh, the uh, sales test was held up in Rochester, New York, in department stores. And that was going on when I arrived. Okay. And so I was uh, hired primarily to uh, design for this line. Mm -hmm. Actually, the line had been designed and, and manufactured in sufficient quantities for the sales test. So when the sales test was very successful and the manufacturing developments were successful, um, it was decided to establish a new department, the tableware department. And so I was the principal designer and the sole designer when this department was formed. Okay. <clears throat> so I quickly got involved with uh, the refinement of the shapes for production, the design of creamer sugars. I work with Jerry Wright, which okay. uh, who I think you interviewed uh, yeah. uh, about Pyrex Ware mm -hmm. because he was working on a lot of the initial carafes and things when okay. I arrived. But Jerry had designed the Corningware line, mm -hmm. and he was uh, designing some special casseroles and a percolator shape that were cook-serve items for mm -hmm. the Centura line. So I worked with him and uh, designed the trademark and worked with the packaging and whatnot, and we introduced the line, and it was an immediate success. Uh, it looked like fine china, although it was opaque, mm -hmm. uh, but it was finely glazed and we had limited decorating capability, uh, but it was guaranteed for three years, which was an innovation. All the consumer had to do was send in the broken pieces and a new right. item was delivered. So. Uh, it was uh, kind of a revolution yeah. to the dinnerware industry at the time. That's very cool. And is Cent Centura is the predecessor for Corel? Is that correct? Is it the you same type? You might say of? so. Yes. Okay. It was more expensive than okay. Corel. Corel was introduced twenty pieces for twenty dollars. Okay. Um, Centura was more up in the range of 40 to 50, 30, 40 dollars mm -hmm. initially. Okay. And then it increased in price as time went on. Mm -hmm. And was it produced here in Corning or where was Centura? Well, uh, Centura was, uh, was pressed, the items were pressed in Shalari, Pennsylvania. 
Okay. They were uh, then uh, shipped to uh, Payton City, West Virginia for finishing. Okay. And uh, so they uh, w were surrammed to the white state and then shipped and glazed and decorated in Payton City, West Virginia. Okay. Cool. And then where were you stationed during this process? Oh, I was here in Corning. Okay. Yeah. Nice. The new tableware department, uh, we began here in C building on the second floor. Okay. We outgrew that. We we're looking for new, uh, a new place, but real estate uh, here in Corning was was uh, hard to come by yeah. uh, in those days. So I ended up in school three up on, uh, up, uh, on Shimong Street. Okay. Uh, we had sort of an ivory tower uh, environment up there. We had these big windows and large classrooms. Nice. And uh, when we had our product review meetings, the man management from down here loved to go up there because they could get away from the telephones. Yeah. And uh, so we developed a staff mm -hmm. uh, under me. About how many people worked with you? Well, uh, two years after the dinnerware department or tableware department was established, I had the opportunity to replace my boss who left, and so they promoted me to the manager of the department. So by that time, I had uh, three designers, an artist, uh, and two engineers who okay. were working for me up in school three. Nice. So we went on from there and developed uh, the commercial pyroceram line. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was my first introduction to Pyrex wear, actually. Nice. Because the basis of the the uh, economy, if you will, of this fledgling department was the commercial Pyrex tableware line. Okay. And that stemmed from a line that was developed, I, I don't know whether it existed or not, when Corning bought uh, or merged with Macbeth Evans mm -hmm. and the Shalleroy plant. Right. But they were making strike in Opal at the mm -hmm. time. And I know that a commercial, uh, that a retail dinnerware line was established. And I don't know when the commercial line uh, came into being, but I do know that every ship in the Navy during World mm -hmm. War II mm -hmm. had Pyrex Opal dinnerware. Yeah, yeah. And ever since the famous big Navy mug, mm -hmm. uh, Pyrex commercial dinnerware it was the mainstay of Corning's activity in that section of the business. Do you remember when you were in the military? Did you see Pyrex when you were um, no, serving? No, by, by that time most of the mess hall stuff was uh, large plastic or metal oh, trays. Okay. <laughs> okay. So no <laughs> or Pyrex maybe thing. plastic mugs. <laughs> okay. But uh, you know when you went into diners or cafeterias and it was big in universities and college yeah. mm -hmm. uh, cafeterias uh, that was its, its place in life as the mm -hmm. low-end commercial business against uh, vitrified China. So you were saying that the, the Pyrex wear kind of set the standard for how you were designing Centura and, and these no, other products? No, what it or? did was it provided us with a base of income to operate oh, okay. Okay. until, you know, the Pyroceram lines mm -hmm. uh, got a footing. So at that point, initially, I was developing full-line decorations with outside designers. Okay. And I was uh, meeting the needs of the sales force who would come and say, I have a diner so-and-so, they have a logo, here it is, put it oh, on Pyrex. So did okay. that happen a lot that you would oh, get yeah, we did a special lot of that commissions business. kind of thing? In fact, uh, the first designer that I hired, I brought in from the cookware group. Huh. He was an uh, artist from Italy. His name was Reno Mercandante. Huh. And Reno uh, had uh, come from Italy and he worked initially uh, at Hawk's Crystal. 
Okay. Designing uh, cut crystal designs. Interesting. And then when Hawks folded, uh, he got the job here uh, within the consumer division. Mm -hmm. And he fit into this uh, business of taking what was required and designing these patterns. And he was very adept and versatile. Nice. So um, how did it work within the, the design department? You said there's engineers and also artists. and and then you were managing these people. So did mm -hmm. they work together to come up with new ideas? Yes, or? yes. Okay. Um, we not only work together, we work with the marketing people very closely. Okay. You know, each, each line had a marketing manager. They were responsible for the development and profitability, mm -hmm. the sales success of their lines. And so really our projects stemmed from uh, the marketing people. Mm -hmm. And did you have a chance to work with the glass makers to, ex to experiment and to develop prototypes and things for your new designs? Well, the process, the answer to your question is yes. Mm -hmm. uh, designers did have intimate contact with the factory people mm -hmm. uh, th along with the product engineers. Mm -hmm. uh, but our job was to come up with ideas, okay. uh, work those ideas. Sometimes there are ideas that uh, came from us to the marketing people. Mm -hmm. And we would verify the, uh, these designs, if you will, uh, through consumer testing. At the time, we were using the Glass Center. Okay. Uh, there was a consumer preference place uh, hmm. located there. And uh, we could put items in against competition mm -hmm. and get uh, visitor responses. Interesting. Uh, in large quantities. Huh. We'd have them in for two, three days, a week, two weeks. And uh, the whole consumer research group developed out of, out of that. Okay. And then we began to get more sophisticated in, t in terms of how we did that as time went on and used outside consultants and focus groups and mm -hmm. things like that. But initially, we got a feeling from consumers as mm -hmm. to the acceptance of ideas and new shapes and redesigns. Nice. Uh, and in those days, it was primarily through the Glass Center. Nice. And they would test um how a product felt and worked, and then also how it looked, like with the, the visual design on the, the yeah. surface, both yeah. of those? Uh, they could handle prototypes. Mostly it was look and respond. Mm -hmm. uh, and remember with Corningware, we used to make things out of vacuum form plastic, or we would hog them out of wood, you know, uh, machine them. Uh, and Can you uh, talk a little bit more about that? So you're talking about how the pieces were, how the molds were made? or How, how the, the prototypes, oh, okay. the models, oh, actually okay. design models were made. Okay. Um, we had a model shop that was located under the foyer of uh, C building. Okay. The entire foyer underneath was mm -hmm. our model shop. It was totally equipped with woodworking and plastic and vacuum forming equipment and a spray booth oh, cool. to paint models white and whatnot. Okay. Uh, so it was for smaller scale prototypes rather than production. Yeah, okay. right. And that's what we did. Uh, we made prototypes however we could mm -hmm. uh, in order to present them to management and to present them to consumers. Great. Can you talk about, um, were there any memorable experiences with presenting new ideas to management that you can think about? <laughs> well, I remember the first time I made a presentation of uh, the Pyrosram scallop rim line. Uh, when we developed um, rim shapes for uh, Pyrosuram. One of the drawbacks from a cost standpoint was 
that the Parasram plates and bowls had to be ground on the edges. <laughs> Standard fire polishing that was used for borosilicate glasses, Pyrex glasses, didn't work. Hmm. Uh, and uh, so the edges were ground and polished, which was uh, an expensive mm -hmm. uh, a step in the total process. So I designed a line that could be free pressed. Okay. You drop a gob, you hit it with a plunger, and the glass travels out and doesn't come to a stop except under its own volition. There's no <laughs> ring out there oh, to stop it. Uh -huh. And so uh, what you do is you put undulations in the mold and you end up with a scalloped edge. Oh, nice. And the scalloped edge kind of hides any out of round that right. might happen if the gob is a little off center. Or right. something. Well, I was presenting this line that I had designed to him and it was the first time that I uh, had made a presentation directly to him. And who was it? Who was this was Lee Waterman, okay. who was uh, then the, uh, the head of our division and went on to be, become president. Okay. Uh, and uh, he was a marketing guy, came from uh, a large carpet company, was re really responsible for the successful marketing and introduction of Corningware that made it such a nationwide immediate mm -hmm. success. Lee had a thumb that had a deformation in it. Uh -huh. Maybe it was a double thumb or a hammer thumb or something. But he had a habit of sitting there and he would drum that thumb <laughs> on the table. And it was very distracting. <laughs> <laughs> but I got through it all right. Another, another example was that uh, when, uh, I, I think this is back in 19, about 1962, Bill Dicker, who was president at the time, uh, said to uh, Bill Armistead, who was the head of uh, the laboratory, he said, glass breaks, why don't we fix that? <laughs> so Armistead agreed. So he took uh, a large force of his able laboratory and set them to work on all of the ways in which you could strengthen glass. Mm -hmm. And one of them was the uh, uh, chemical strengthening <laughs> out of which came this new fusion uh, uh, flat mm -hmm. glass process. They tried to get into the wind, windshield business, you know, automobile windshields, and it was right. a failure. Uh, the market really just wasn't there for something uh, that was that we couldn't get the price down. Mm -hmm. But all of that fundamental work over 40 years later turned out gorilla glass. So you never know. Right. So things but come anyway, back at that point, the laboratory had come to me uh, and said, we have an interesting thing here for you. It's a piece of bent glass, clear glass, made from clear glass sheet that you can bend. <laughs> you can open and close it like this. What can you do with that? And I said, well, we could make salad tongs. Huh. And, you know, Centura was a line at that time. It was successful. Uh, we had some large serving bowls. How about mm -hmm. an accessory? Well, what we planned on doing was that uh, w at the next review meeting, we were going to take our large Centura serving bowl, fill it with a salad, have salad plates for all the management, and we were going to serve salad with, these, with this new <laughs> innovative uh, salad tom. And so I'll never forget this. The designer, uh, George Horton, um, who is a, a black man that I had uh, hired, wonderful designer, uh, was, was actually doing the buttling. You know, he, was, he was carrying it around and he was okay. serving <laughs> the salad. And he was serving a Jim Beer, who was the head of our department. And he grasped 
and he was just about to drop the salad on Jim's plate when the salad tongs went into a million pieces. Oh, no. <laughs> it just exploded. <laughs> and it, sol it salted the entire <laughs> salad. <laughs> and Jim said, Jim was an unflappable guy. He said, well, I guess we send that back to the lab. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. It's a great story. Yeah. So, did you have very many experiences like that where you were presenting? And it sounds like you had a very creative way to present yeah. to management. Well, I'll never forget also when we were in Chicago at the, um, it was at the, commercial tableware show and we're introducing the uh, Pyroceram rim shape line for the first time. To Which, what was the line? Pyroceram? This is a Pyroceram tableware. Okay. It's a, a new, brand new commercial tableware line okay. uh, for the fine hotel and fine okay. restaurant business, okay. higher end. Mm -hmm. It was really made of the same material as Centura. Okay. And <coughs> we all afternoon we practice. Mm -hmm. And the dramatic part of this presentation was that we had a tray that was suspended and on it were a stack of plates. Uh -huh. And at a given moment, the tray would tip and the plates would cascade down in onto a, uh, a, a maple plank uh, in a clear plastic box. Okay. Okay. Just in case anything broke, right. it wouldn't, the pieces wouldn't scatter right. out into the audience. And uh, we just practice this two or three times in the afternoon and uh, everything was fine. You know, the plates went down, they didn't break. The only thing that we didn't do was we didn't replace the plates. Oh. The brand new plates. Okay. Because when glass falls and, and hits, it's, hits one another, you know, uh -huh. uh, it will cause impact. Hmm. Uh, it may not break, but as it impacts, it becomes a little weaker huh. and a little weaker. Interesting. Uh, and uh, so Jim was going through his presentation, you know, and he pulls the string and, and all of the plates go cascading down and two of them broke. Uh oh. And he said, see that? If that was China, they all would have broken. <laughs> <laughs> and he went right on with his presentation. He almost have to be a good actor too. Oh yeah. He was like improv. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great. It's really interesting. So do you know the science behind that? Like how the glass, it almost sounds like it has a memory if you drop it, um, that it remembers that weak point? Is it, does it rearrange something in the glass that makes no, it weaker? No, it's just, uh, just the impact causes a, uh, a bruise oh, okay. in the glass. And that bruise could then propagate from being, being impacted again Okay. Or it could propagate from uh, a fast change in temperature, oh. like going into a microwave oven or an right. oven or being placed next to something that was hot, okay. really hot. Okay, interesting. So did you, with your time at, at Corning, it sounds like you had a quick learning curve to learn and understand glass and how the properties of glass and in a lot of different materials. So the pyroceram right. and pyrex, all these different types of glass. Right. Can you talk a little bit about what you learned and maybe some of the things that impressed you about glass or that you found frustrating or interesting or? Well, glass is an interesting material in that it, <clears throat> you know, it can be many things and it can be clear and opaque and Corning always went to market with something that was better than what existed. Mm -hmm. And usually it stemmed from the capability of the glass or glass ceramic material itself. 
And so, you know, I never did really get into the properties of glass or the things that the guys in the laboratory know very well. Uh, my main concern was, uh, was with what's the potential for forming this material to create the shapes that we want to okay. design with it. And what are the limitations of the processes in the plant mm -hmm. uh, to be able to do uh, what we'd like to do. And over time, w we got to know enough about it so that we would try to nudge the process, you know, mm -hmm. stretch the envelope a little bit to do things that were, that were really required. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, Corningware, when it was introduced, had very small knobs mm -hmm. on the covers, mm -hmm. had smaller handles, mm -hmm. um, had larger radiuses in the bottom to move the glass easily up the sidewall. All of those things had to change over time mm -hmm. because consumers were saying, we want more grippability, mm -hmm. we want more handleability. And did that come through the consumer testing that was at? Yeah, so our various you know, inputs okay. that we got from research, a lot of focus groups, okay. we delved into those aspects. Uh, the gals in the test kitchen were mm -hmm. telling us, you know, improvements like this will only help mm -hmm. the consumer response to your okay. product. And so we worked on uh, those kinds of improvements, working closely with the engineers and the plants in order to achieve that, both on the Pyrex Opal mm -hmm. clear line and the redesigns of Corningware lines from the initial mm -hmm. square round shape that Jerry designed, uh, the counter that cooks came along and the innovation of glass top cooking. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Corningware shapes had to be broader, mm -hmm. tighter radiuses, straighter sides as they became serious cookware top stove items. Mm -hmm. They had to be ground in polish to mate with that smooth surface mm -hmm. of the pyroceram sheet for intimate contact and transfer of energy mm -hmm. uh, through essentially insulating surfaces. Mm -hmm. You know, glass is a great insulator and not a great conductor. So you have to uh, modify mm -hmm. uh, by design to make it function better. Interesting. Uh, so those are some of the things that we're yeah. concerned with. Yeah. Uh, we also were very interested in developing a creative process. Okay. Um, in the 1980s, we became aware of the creative, pro creative pro uh, problem solving program at the University of Buffalo mm. that was started by advertising people in New York mm -hmm. who uh, really coined <coughs> the word brainstorming oh, okay. and how you handle brainstorming sessions and how you go from uh, no judgment to final judging what you can get in a long list of ideas and singling out those best things hmm. that look like they're most appropriate. And we used to do that. We used to, my department had uh, a couple of guys who were really good at this. Uh, one of them uh, you may have met because he's done some work here. Uh, I think for the museum, but anyway, <coughs> his name. we're we're generating ideas for the marketing people okay. uh, quite a bit through the years. Okay. Dennis Young. Dennis Young. Yeah. yeah, we did. We yeah. have interviewed Dennis. So. Oh, you have. Yeah. Okay. And he okay. talked a little bit about the the measuring cups and. Oh yeah, and that's his work with that. that's one of uh, the things that. I think that was one of the uh, most unusual innovations that we're involved with. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, 
we had designed the Visions line. Mm -hmm. and Visions was essentially cookware, and the big problem was pressing that glass handle, mm -hmm. integral glass handle, uh, that was long enough, that had enough mm -hmm. guts to it so you could really grab it. And uh, when that was successful, um, Dennis, I think, uh, came, I, I don't know what the process was, but I think that Dennis came to me because he was involved with d designing those items. And he said, you know, it would be interesting if we could try to do that with Pyrex, with a measuring cup, and then bend the handle over a mandrel. You know, mm -hmm. when it comes hot off the press with its handle out, bend the handle over a mandrel and then we'd have an open handle mm -hmm. so it would stack or nest with itself mm -hmm. it would nest with other items and i latched onto that immediately i thought that was a fabulous idea nice. and uh, it took some development but it was successful to do that and he designed those new shapes mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it was an innovation when it was introduced, yeah. and uh, its success was indicated by the fact that every one of our competitors made the change as soon as they could do it. Oh, really? Huh. Yeah, because we just scooped the market. Yeah. And it's interesting also that since that time, there's been an awful lot of in innovation in measuring cups, particularly in plastics. That's Not necessarily with just a bent handle, uh -huh. but there are all, all kinds of new configurations mm -hmm. of measuring cups, different forms where you can see the, the graduations from different angles and whatnot. Mm -hmm. well, Pyrex remains one of the standards for measuring cups still, so uh -huh. Uh -huh. everybody uses Pyrex measuring cups. So yeah. That's great. Yeah. What are some other products that you had a hand in designing or helping with, um, or well, worked with managing <coughs> the design of? Yeah. You know, as time went on, well, it was actually uh, during the Corel uh, development program, uh, it was decided that uh, the division would merge the cookware department and the tableware department. Mm -hmm. And <coughs> so the engineer who headed the, ta the cookware department became responsible for all the product engineering. And I became responsible for all the product design hmm. for all the lines. Up to that point, I was concerned with tableware, mm -hmm. mostly. Um, but now I had all the lines, Corningware, Pyrexware, Corel. Wow. We had developed Corel in the tableware mm -hmm. group. But the decorations were being done uh, by the cookware decoration designers as well mm -hmm. as our own designers mm -hmm. in order to get the project going as fast as possible. Mm. Uh, <coughs> and uh, so my scope of responsibility expanded considerably. Sounds like it. And I inherited all the designers from the cookware group mm. and all their projects as wow. well. And so uh, I became much, much more involved mm -hmm. with Pyrex okay. at that point. When was that? What, what year? That was, was 1967. Okay. So, so I joined in 61. I became a manager for mm -hmm. the depart tableware department in uh, 63. Mm -hmm. And in 67, I was then managing all the design for the entire division. So mm -hmm. it, was, it was an interesting yeah. time. Sounds like it was an exciting time that a lot of the different products, you could probably see a lot of changes happening with mm -hmm. um, consumers mm -hmm. with Pyrex and like Py Pyrex was only around till the 80s, I believe, um, and but then some of the other products lived on past that. Mm -hmm. So how did you deal with with that, with the different demands on the different types of products? Did you, was there any strategies on designing things kind of cross 
across all of the different types of glass, like making things the same or with sharing patterns? I know there was the compatibles line uh -huh, that came out. Uh -huh. Well, when we developed Corel, and, uh, and it was an immediate success, uh, it was kind of a shoe-in for us to take the Pyrex Opal line mm -hmm. and to put the Corel decorations on that. Mm -hmm. One of the things that, uh, that w was ongoing for that Opal line was to refresh the decorations that okay. decorated the casseroles and the mixing bowls mm -hmm. and all the bakeware items and to do that periodically. But every year also, um, we de designed and, and introduced a, a line of Pyrex Opal giftware. Hmm. I remember John Book, who was the marketing manager, liked to say, a happy dealer is a loaded dealer. <laughs> and uh, he just loved to uh, load up these dealers with this seasonal giftware line. Uh -huh. So we had to put this together every summer to get it ready for fall okay. distribution for Christmas. And uh, that was kind of a breath of fresh air for the designers because when it came to a full line, you designed things uh, that had to go in front of extensive consumer mm -hmm. testing and comparison testing and whatnot. With the gift line, they could just express themselves. All we had to do was come out with a variety of colors, variety of styles, and, and each product had to be exciting and look good and nice. offer the opportunity to sell to different tastes. Okay. And we didn't need a uh, consumer response. If the uh, marketing and sales guys liked it, we did it. Cool. And it was one pattern every year? Or was there no, more than one? No, it was probably five or six oh, okay. different shapes that were decorated oh, okay. for that line. Okay. So <coughs> with this existing, uh, the fact that Pyrex Opal was a, a big part of the decorative aspect mm -hmm. of Pyrex, when Corel came along, Corel coordinates right. uh, began with decorating Pyrex. Okay. Huh. And every new product that we introduced in the simple uh, direct screen mm -hmm. Uh, lowest pri uh, price part of the Corel line, um, we had Pyrex coordinates. Okay, nice. Very cool. I have a very specific question for you. You might not know the answer because we haven't been able to track it down. And I'm curious about like the names of all of these patterns and um, kind of the marketing, if it was something that the designers did or if it was a different department that put names on some of these patterns but one of the patterns we were trying to figure out was cinderella and where the name cinderella for the cinderella bowls came from i know it came in the ni late 1950s but i wasn't sure if you knew anything about the cinderella line of <coughs> objects it existed i think it was all blue wasn't it i think it came in several different colors i think the first one was that kind of the Amish print, the butter yeah, print pattern. Right, right. Um, but then I think it, it continued <coughs> after that into different types and styles, so. No, I wasn't involved with that. That was all done uh, before. before I arrived. Okay, you know. all right. But uh, the marketing people were responsible for naming things. Oh, okay. Although we used to have brainstorming sessions for mm -hmm. them. Okay. On product names. Uh -huh. Nice. So with some of the special commissions you talked about where people would come and bring their logo that wa they wanted to put on things, was that ongoing through your career at Corning? Well, uh, it was mostly for the commercial dinnerware. Okay. Uh, initially for Pyrex, but uh, when we introduced Pyrex Ram dinnerware, oh, okay. The higher end hotels all had their looks. Mm -hmm. A hotel might have five restaurants in it. Mm -hmm. Each one had a different style. Okay. And the interior designers 
would actually design the patterns mm -hmm. that they wanted and we would develop them and put them on the wire. Okay. When we introduced uh, the Pyrosram uh, commercial dinnerware line, it was done with considerable fanfare mm -hmm. uh, in New York City at the uh, commercial tableware show. Uh, and the line uh, was y used throughout the brand new New York Hilton Hotel okay. that had opened the same, uh, about the same time. Mm -hmm. So we're in all of the restaurants, we're in banquet, we're in room service, wow. and everything had different decorations. Yeah. And we had some really flashy place plates that were decaled all over. Mm -hmm. and Things that we wouldn't normally do mm -hmm. in production, but the New York Hilton paid for them. You know, they bought them, so we made them. Cool. So uh, that was a huge introduction. Yeah, that's great. Um, did you ever design things internally? Were there ever were you able to do offhand things that weren't necessarily put out for production? Um, maybe just commemorative items for staff or that type of thing? Was that part of, did that play into your job at no, all? No, we no. never had time for that. No. no. Okay. No. But I uh, had an excellent designer, Cindy Giroux, who uh, did uh, most of the Centura decorations. We also worked with a stable of outside designers Mm -hmm. And that became more important with the Corel hmm. lines as Corel became stratified into good, better, and best mm -hmm. with the expressions line at the top and the living wear line mm -hmm. at the bottom and two other lines that were really differentiated mostly by decoration as well as shape. Hmm. We got into a number of different shapes with Corel. Mm -hmm. Not as much as they're doing now. Yeah. Uh, okay. World Kitchens has done a lot more mm -hmm. in terms of shape development with all of their lines okay. than we ever did. Okay. Because they have an entirely different uh, accounting process mm -hmm. than we did. Huh. Interesting. You know, when you had to have to any up five to eight percent to the cost of R&D, which was mm -hmm. actually a, a very, very essential to mm -hmm. the Corning Corporation right. to reinvent itself about every 10 years. Yeah. Um, it was uh, a major drawback in terms of what we might be able to do. Mm -hmm. uh, because the money wasn't there. Mm -hmm. But other companies that don't have that tremendous overhead uh, can be a lot more flexible. Mm -hmm. And so you see that flexibility hmm. with World Kitchens. So you were, you had left Corning before they sold to World Kitchen to, yes. um, do you, was there much um, discussion when you were still at Corning about ending the consumer products division, or is that something that... Yes, there was. <coughs> Probably the last uh, five to six years of my career, mm -hmm. it was discussed uh, now and then. Mm -hmm. and we all sort of knew that uh, the uh, corporate management wanted to move Corning into a high-tech mm -hmm. mode. Mm -hmm and the Corning Glassworks became Corning Incorporated mm -hmm. before I retired. Mm -hmm. uh, and the handwriting was on the wall. And mm -hmm. I told my boss, I said, when it looks like it's eminent, uh, if it uh, happens uh, about the time or is going to happen about the time that I've reached my 30 years, mm -hmm. you know, the magic numbers were 55 and 30 years. Yeah. Uh, I said, I'll take my retirement. Hmm. So he agreed on that, and I had hired a replacement for myself mm -hmm. about a year, a year before, and he was ready, ready to take over when okay. I left. Well, that's cool. 
Nice. Did you enjoy your time at Corning? Extremely. Good. Extremely. Yeah. We were always on the leading edge of things, and that, nice. was, that was great. Nice. But uh, some of the interesting things uh, that added a little salt and pepper to the whole thing was developing Pyrex products, mm -hmm. principally for the blownware, mm. blowing Pyrex uh, in Muskogee. And that yeah. was something they started blowing when Pyrex started with the Frederick Carter teapots and then they moved to pressing and then they decided to reintroduce blowing. Is that kind of how that worked? Well, I don't know exactly uh, when it began mm -hmm. because the Muskogee plant was in operation when I arrived. Okay. Uh, they were making all of the blanks for Proctor Silex and Bunomatic, okay. commercial coffee makers, great volume. Okay. Uh, we had a specialty sales force that mm -hmm. were, uh, they were selling incentives uh, to S and H green stamps. Hmm. Uh, I recall that we were involved with uh, with some specific items for them that were incentives that were sold with a certain number of gallons of gas at filling oh, stations. Yeah. Uh, there were little blown vessels that snapped into plastic uh, yeah. holders to make mugs and yeah. cups. And, you know, huge volumes mm -hmm. uh, were manufactured and sold mm -hmm. of those items. And uh, Jerry and Bill Curtis had designed some beautiful crafts, and they were part of the gift line and okay. teapots and things like that. So all of this where came from Muskogee, all of the right. type, that type right. of dishes. They okay. had a process called the turret chain machine. What is it called again? Turret chain? Turret chain. Turret chain. Nicknamed the terrible chain machine. <laughs> but nonetheless, it had a lot of versatility. And uh, I recall just uh, prior to um, my getting the, the overall responsibility for the division's products, the cookware group <coughs> had spent a lot of time, and a number of designers were involved with this program researching uh, all of the products that consumers bought and packages that they transferred into containers. Hmm. Uh, and uh, there wasn't really an organized uh, approach to this, except for the tin or right. metal canisters right. that you could buy. But nothing was transparent, huh. so you could see what was in Oh, interesting. And, uh, <coughs> so they developed a line that eventually was called Star and Sea. Uh -huh. And that was uh, a series of different diameters that stacked up that had nice plastic covers. They mm -hmm. learned to evacuate lugs so you mm -hmm. could tighten that cover down. And they had a, uh, a flexible gasket inside mm -hmm. that pressed onto the glass so that it was airtight. Mm -hmm. And it was a really well thought out line. Nice. And I sort of inherited that mm -hmm. uh, in the later stages. Okay. And uh, we went to market with that in white, white covers. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, with the flexibility of coloring and decorating plastic, you know, it just became part of a Corel coordinate line yeah, yeah. as well. Uh, <coughs> and Corel coordinates became a much bigger business when mm -hmm. uh, marketing decided to license our designs. Mm. And so at that point, you know, when Corel was, uh, was so successful, uh, other manufacturers began to put their own designs uh, uh, to relate to ours. They oh, weren't the same because we patented right. everything that right. we could patent. Uh, with design patents. <coughs> and so it was decided that uh, we would open this up, and so I became responsible as the arbiter of uh, the design that went on to their products. They designed it, I approved it. It became a business where 
just about everybody that sold anything that was decorative in the housewares departments and in department stores had Corel coordinates. It was a massive assortment of stuff when you put it all together. Yeah. And it became quite a good business for us uh, nice. because we gained royalties on mm -hmm. every item that sold. Nice. Uh, Where was the plastic produced? So I, I know like in the 70s and 80s there was a lot of plastic components, even the 60s, like on the salt and pepper shakers and the carafes. Mm -hmm. Where was all of that produced? Well, it was produced by outside suppliers. Okay. Uh, I couldn't give you the names mm -hmm. of them, there are many. Yeah. But uh, we relied on outside mm -hmm. suppliers for that. We never got into the plastic business. And that was a lot of the mounters too, like they had the mental yep. mounters yep. even were Metal external. mounters or yeah. wood cradles. Or, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And that was all external. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, one of, uh, one of uh, the most successful ways of accessorizing Pyrex wear, which you can still see if you go into mm -hmm. the company store because World Kitchens is still uh, refreshing the same mm -hmm. idea, mm -hmm. <coughs> was we learned from research that consumers really needed something where they could take a hot dish right out of the oven mm -hmm. to a dish to pass supper or a family event or mm -hmm. something outside the home. Right. And so with the Opelika company down in Mississippi, we developed uh, these, a line called Bake and Carry, mm -hmm. uh, which was insulated yeah. fabric with handles. And that concept has been copied by almost everybody. Yeah. And it's so successful and so needed mm -hmm. that uh, you can do it with a variety of yeah. um, different shapes, large casseroles, big baking dishes. Yeah. They all have plastic covers now, so mm -hmm. you know, it makes, c makes it convenient. Yeah. Uh, it is a fun innovation. We have a couple pieces in our collection Dave. that have that. So, uh -huh. And it looks very old-fashioned and homemade and yeah. very yeah. homespun kind of feel to well, it. Well, you could refresh it very easily just mm -hmm. uh, with different patterns and colors in the fabric. Nice. Uh, and we even had uh, found a supplier in Rhode Island who, uh, who would print our own designs on a limited oh, okay. basis. Huh. In, uh, on the fabrics? On the fabrics. Oh, so nice. we had Corel Corden. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So you worked with a lot of people just all over the place for any uh -huh. need that you had. Uh -huh. So that's great. Getting back to Blownware. Blownware oh, yeah, was... Uh, was uh, Probably the most versatile uh, way in which we could get in and out of products mm -hmm. and develop some new things, some things that were uh, successful, some that were, we got a marvelous response from consumers and then didn't sell through and maybe lasted a few years and then died off. Hmm. But after Store and Sea was so successful, mm -hmm. And during the time when the division was uh, hurting a little uh, from a margin standpoint, mm -hmm. uh, we had lost fair trade or the ability to protect prices. Hmm. Uh, Walmart and Kmart mm -hmm. uh, were becoming much bigger and because of their size, they were dictating oh, what price they wanted to buy things at, and which was hurting <laughs> margins. So we began <coughs> to develop products uh, more so for department store level, hmm. where we could sell in at higher, rent, higher prices. Hmm. And the marketing manager came to, to us one day and said, what I'd like to have is I'd like to have a store in sea line, but I want it to be more beautiful. Hmm. I want it to be all clear glass. I hmm. want to sell it into department stores and it has to be lovely. It has to be lovely. What does that <laughs> mean? Well, he couldn't tell us. So I, si I signed it to a designer and he worked on a number of things. And we didn't go to consumers with that. We went back to John and essentially said, is it lovely enough? 
So uh, w Ted was sort of at his uh, wit's end, and I remember at one of my personal reviews with the designers, I said to him, why don't you do the opposite of what you're doing with the cover? He was trying to develop a blown knob of some kind. Mm -hmm. I said, do the opposite and create a depression hmm. so that you can put your finger in the hole and your thumb on the outside edge and lift it off that way. Hmm. So he went to work. And his solution was gorgeous. Uh, we could make these beautiful cylindrical shapes. And so the key to it was how that cover looked. Mm -hmm. And so he designed something that we presented to John. And John looked at it, and it had that lovely touch. That That's good. <laughs> so we introduced that line, and it was quite successful. And what was that called? It was called Creative Glass. Okay, mm. nice. And it was a, strictly a department store line, so a lot nice. of people don't know uh -huh. very much about it. Or were products like the Uncandle um, also produced for department stores? No, was Uncandle that? was no. a mass market oh, item. Okay. Although we did make some for department stores only because okay. It was so successful and electric that department stores wanted it, but they didn't want the same thing that we we're selling mm -hmm. in mass merchants. In fact, the whole department store emphasis in the last decade of my involvement here at Corning uh, was very important mm -hmm. because it, w it was recognized as a way to get incremental new business, even mm -hmm. to the point where a special department was developed and headed by a couple of people that they had hired mm -hmm. out of New York City to, um, to head up a department called Crown Corning, okay. which was products primarily for the department store oh, level. Okay. And I lost one of my best designers who oh. went with them to, to develop products. Hmm. And, but prior to setting up this separate entity, I had the responsibility of developing more department store looks. Mm -hmm. uh, and Uncandles was another way of utilizing the Muskogee mm -hmm. uh, production capability. Nice. And the story behind that goes something like this. Uh, Ted Rada, uh, one of my designers who worked mostly on the blown ore stuff and had designed the creative glass line, had gone to a trade show and he had seen this little uh, product with a floating candle, uh -huh. a floating wick. Mm -hmm. And he came back and we talked about it and he said, uh, this has got to work. Uh, it would be a great Pyrex gift item. Mm -hmm. Marketing wasn't interested because it wasn't a food-related item. Hmm. But we were, with Corel, we were on the table anyway. Right. You know? So we were persistent about it. So I said, go ahead and make up some plastic prototypes and let's learn a little more about it. And so he did. And through the Glass Center, uh, we got uh, an excellent response. And the thing that uh, consumers liked about it most was that it was safe. <laughs> right. You put water in it, you put a little vegetable oil, you float this, uh, this burning wick, and if it tipped over, the water doused the flame. <laughs> and you had the opportunity to make all sorts of shapes yeah. uh, with the blown process and to get in and out of shapes with the minimum expense in terms of molds. Nice. Uh, and uh, so we finally sold the marketing people on the idea once we got some consumer response. Nice. And the uh, three vertical uncandles mm -hmm. were mm -hmm. the first that was introduced, mm -hmm. and it was electric. Nice. And so for five or six years, we kept uh, refreshing that line and making lines for department stores until competition caught us and underpriced us and we 
got out of the market yeah. and did something else. Yeah. <laughs> I saw um, you had mentioned in your email something about with visions and the plant helpers, like the, oh, yeah. so that type of thing. Can you talk yeah, about that? Yeah, that's a great story. Uh -huh. <coughs> we had uh, developed this brown uh, variation uh, for the Pyrex covers mm -hmm. to match the visions. Mm -hmm. And we had an idea session as to what we might do with this new color glass. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to do something totally incremental, mm -hmm. not just another casserole line right. that was brown. And uh, one of the designers said, uh, you know, there's a lot going on in uh, flower pots and in mm -hmm. planters and homes. And you see <coughs> cons uh, rising consumer interest in plants generally in the home. Why don't we make some flower pots? So I thought that was a good idea. And we, since it was, re it's really a, f uh, a totally foreign area right, to, right. to us housewares, kitchen oriented people, we decided to uh, get some advice from a consultant. So we hired James Underwood Crockett uh, Jim had uh, uh, authored some books on uh, plants, and he had a very successful TV uh, series up here in New England called Crockett's Victory Garden. Huh. And uh, Jim got very excited about it. Uh, he thought that, you know, with the brown tint to the glass, the roots would be protected from sunlight. Hmm. Um, he found that the glass didn't absorb water like ceramic did. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, there was more moisture for a longer period available in the soil for the roots. And one of the problems of failures with plants was they didn't get watered enough. Right. Uh, and he also felt that uh, being glass the ability to clean the underliners and clean the shapes themselves between use mm -hmm. was, was a, uh, a good opportunity too. So we uh, convinced um, the marketing people. We went ahead and made some glass prototypes and then we made another stop before we introduced. We took the prototypes and set up some major tests at Cornell. And so these were uh, by the botanical uh, garden, uh, or the mm -hmm. section of Cornell. Mm -hmm. They had student program and a big study, and uh, they proved that uh, glass was better than plastics huh. and ceramics for raising plants. That's cool. And through their work, we also uh, added <laughs> clear Pyrex dome covers mm. so as to make terrariums. Oh, yeah. So you could uh, start with seedlings and develop from a seedling the full plant. That's interesting. Uh, so by this, and marketing found out that 60% of the planters were being sold through their distribution. So they were sold at that point. Nice. It was a product development success, but a marketing. I won't call it a failure, but it just didn't sell that well. Yeah. And mainly it was that we had such a broad story to tell mm -hmm. that the package told the story, but the package made it a housewares item, whereas flower pots were sold stacked up. Oh. Okay. That's true. Uh, yeah. We had a lot of expense in the package. It w uh, so the product was expensive at retail compared to flower pots, plastic, right. <coughs> or uh, ceramic that stacked up in the corner. Interesting. Uh, and so it didn't sell that well. Huh. But I have them at home and I use them all the time. Great. I think they're great. Somebody could have picked that up, a small company could have picked that up and made a real business right. out of it. Well, we are out of time, oh, but yeah, it's Boy, been really, nice. it's been wonderful. And I mean, 
I could probably sit for another hour and a half if you wanted to do another session. We could <laughs> definitely set something up. But um, thank you so much for sharing your story. And it sounds like you have a lot more to tell. So maybe we can set up something in a couple well, weeks. Well, uh, there are a few more, perhaps. Yeah. All right. Well, maybe we can talk to Rebecca and see if, if we could do a part two at some point. It would be great to okay. keep talking. So.